Well, my sermon title today is What's Wrong with Men? And I can't imagine that there were a number of women who were controlling the impulse to raise their hand and say, give me the pulpit, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> By God, let me up there, I'll tell you what the whole thing is. When I speak today of men, I am referring to white heterosexual males. I'm staying in my lane. And because that is the dominant group in our society, both in size and influence, and is where the problems arise. Amen. I think this might be one of those sermons where I get a lot of amens, you know, from women. We'll see. <clears throat> I am a member of that group. Let me say, jumping ahead, that I wish to offer praise and thanksgiving to the men of this congregation for exemplifying constructive and positive masculine models. It's true. <laughs> and really, one of the gifts of this congregation and any UU congregation is it is composed, at least partially, of men who are trying to exemplify, often against daunting odds, positive masculinity models. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'd like to point out things that we already know but are important to be reminded of, and that is the power in our world of toxic masculinity. In societies, not only here, God knows it's true here, but throughout the world, throughout the world. The examples are plentiful. Just this week in Germany, 25 people were arrested conspiring to storm the capital and kill the chancellor of Germany. Among those detained was a German prince, a former member of parliament, an active soldier and former member of the police and elite special forces. Their aim was to kill the chancellor and reinstate essentially the Nazi state. For the last 10 years, the intelligence services of Germany have said to any politician who will listen that the greatest threat to Germany was internal terrorist groups grounded in white males. They've been saying that for more than 10 years. The invasion of Ukraine by Russia in February is an outright epidemic and spread of a disease of toxic masculinity. There has been careless destruction of hospitals, schools, the deaths of innocent men, women, and non-combatants. This war has created havoc, a humanitarian crisis, economic turmoil, which we ourselves feel right now and was started and continues to be run by men mad with the delusion of power and delusions of greatness. During the last 10 years, our society has become increasingly aware of police brutality, particularly against people of color, who are committing those acts, white males. The action of expelling from the police any officer or police officer who has a record of domestic abuse has been rejected again and again by police unions and others across the country, organizations run by white men. On January the 6th, 2001, a mob of men with very few women involved attacked the United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C., with the intent to overthrow an election, and some think to kill people like Nancy Pelosi. Our current political situation, which involves 
60 or 65 million people, many of them white males, supporting a person who has explicitly anti-democratic aims, points to a deep problem in the mass psychology of millions of white males. It is, by and large, men who seek and sometimes succeed in amassing billions of dollars and then protecting their wealth using the influence, their influence to create laws that protect their wealth against fair taxation. It is overwhelmingly men who run the oil companies and lobby for oil companies, which threaten the ecological balance of nature upon which the futures of our children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren depend. It is men who promoted ways, clever ways, to limit the rights of women regarding their health care choices, in particular regarding childbirth and child care choices. It is men who at the state, national, and regional level are literally, literally trying to control the bodies of women. It is political leaders throughout the world, peppered all over the world, like the current North Korean leader, who continually threaten the world with the threat of nuclear annihilation. It is men who own and run Fox News, the greatest disseminator of misinformation, lies, and deception the American news scene has ever seen. The criminal gangs running the drug trade out of Mexico, bringing the poisons of meth, heroin, and cocaine, and other poisons are male-dominated and led. It is men who took incredible, risky financial positions, which created a financial condition for this country which led to a crisis in 2007, which nearly plunged the country into another Great Depression. It has been men who have led the NRA's abhorrent practice of fighting all meaningful gun legislation for decades. It is men who menace one in four women who have experienced violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Recently, someone shot up, or several people shot up power substations in North Carolina, putting 40,000 people without power. I don't think it was a group of women who did that. <laughs> but a connected story is that last February the 3rd, white supremacists, all men obviously, pled guilty to, to a plot, and I quote, attack power substations or power grids with powerful rider, rifles as a way to bring about a race war. Toxic masculinity not only threatens us all, but impacts the lives of men. Men die at an earlier age on average than women. Mental health experts have long known that while women have nearly twice the rate of depression diagnoses. Men are much more likely to die by suicide, drug overdose, and alcohol-related deaths, sometimes referred to as the deaths of despair. Nearly 80% of suicides are among men. And those are not young men. Those are older men in their 70s who simply have reached a point of terminal giving up. Women are more likely to seek out help, hence some of their, their, their better health outcome. Why? Because of the perception of weakness. And there's this whole thing among mental health care workers in this country trying to, to rebrand counseling as what gives a person strength so that more men will come in. What's wrong with men? Men are, I believe, wired to view themselves and to see the world within the framework of a social hierarchy. And the question 
raises itself to every man. Where am I in that hierarchy? Defined by status, by money, by this, by that. Men are wired, I think, to see life as occurring within a competitive environment. I remember the first time I <coughs> entered the UU flock as a minister, and I would go to ministers' meetings, which were, at that time, largely dominated by men. And one of the first subjects <laughs> the group of ministers would talk about is how big their churches were. <laughs> or, or <laughs> is any of this familiar? or have, what their attendance is, or, oh my God, our attendance has increased by 20%, or if they couldn't do anything there, they would go over to the budget. Oh, our budget is up 25%. And it was sort of like, who's got the bigger, better situation? And that, that just came up innately. It wasn't part of the agenda. Men to an extent, I believe, not found among women, are susceptible to a kind of power and competition obsessiveness. It is a type of madness that does not see the wisdom of collaboration, that does not see the reality of interdependence, that seems hell-bent on pursuing, at all costs, self-interest, control, and dominance at all costs. Male environments at work and play are permeated with ways to measure one standing in the hierarchy. There are precious few resources in our society in which men can find places to cultivate habits of positive masculinity. And this is one of the great tragedies of our society. The poet Robert Bly, does anybody remember that name, Robert Bly? The poet Robert Bly, he was really big about 30 years ago. Robert Bly was a prolific poet, translator, and essayist who was a galvanizing force in the anti-war movement of the Vietnam era. But in 1990, Robert Bly published a book called Iron John, a book about men. Has anybody ever heard of that? A few. Well, it's, I see, not, not many. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 62 weeks and was translated into many languages. He became, Robert Bly became extremely popular and well-known, interviewed by Bill Moyers on PBS. He died about a year ago at age 94. I encountered him during the zenith of his popularity in the 1990s. Bly was a controversial figure. I do not agree with everything he ever said or did or believed. But by God, he did try to bring a message of positive masculinity to men. He is known and beloved by many men for holding workshops to discuss and explore positive masculinity. I went to a number of these. I sponsored one of them in Florida. I got to know Robert Bly a little bit. All the workshops I went to had hundreds of men. And the first time I met uh, Robert Bly, it was in North Florida. And he said to me, looked at me in the eye and he said, do I need to put on my armor? And by that he meant, how guarded do I need to be toward you? And that's, that's a male thing that's kind of, I think, hard for a lot of people to understand. In these workshops, which were free form, Bly would be on a stage he would read various stories or poetry or out of his own book, Iron John, or something else. And he always had at least four people with him. One was a psychotherapist who specialized in male issues. Another guy who was a New Testament scholar from the University of Chicago. Another guy who was a shaman from Guatemala that he was very close friends with. And then there was a fourth person who held up 
a, another perspective. But Bly was trying to create something that was new for men and that dealt with something primordial for men. His message was a bit chaotic and freeform, but part of his message was that men need to develop relationships with other men. That men, especially young men, need positive male mentors. That men can transform what he called their warrior energy into positive goals. And that without the careful cultivation of these things, men can go off the rails very easily. Men, he taught, need to be taught in the ways of being a man, that it is not a given. Examples of positive directions of male energy would be taking that warrior energy, as he called it, toward environmental work, helping the marginalized, using one's privilege to help the unprivileged, building community, addressing male isolation, which is acute, writing music and playing music, and in many other ways. So broadly speaking, male energy can be directed towards creativity and so help to restore the brokenness of the world. In such ways, Bly encouraged men to be men, but to be on guard against the ways male energy goes towards the dark side. Bly and his workshops became famous. His workshops drew public attention. I remember one situation where he had a workshop with hundreds of people, and there were all kinds of people, men there, and the press wanted to come in and to record what he was doing. And he said, don't let them in, because if you let them in, they will ruin us. And essentially, that's what happened. Some of the men who were hearing about Bly all over this country came to the conclusion that he was not Christian enough, which was a valid complaint. He was going for something that was deeper in the human experience and deeper in human history. And so some men around the country started their own groups. Well, one of the natural places for such men's groups to arise was in churches because that's a place where men gather. And so it was in the late 90s, I heard the first word of a new group that had rose up in competition with Bly's people, and it was called the Oath Keepers. Has anybody ever heard of them? They were at first a rather benign and positive group, which explicitly identified with Christianity, but over a period of years and even decades, they took a dark turn. They moved towards a militaristic way of thinking. And other groups arose from them, some more fanatical, such as the Proud Boys. And in these movements, male energy was going in exactly the opposite directions that Bly talked about. But Bly's positive message did have a positive impact in some parts of our culture. One of them was in UU congregations. An example of that is my dear friend, UU minister, Reverend Tom Owen Toll of San Diego, who wrote numerous books about cultivating positive masculinity, and led and taught in numerous workshops on that subject. The UU movement helps to create and sustain a positive masculinity. At this congregation, 
I have got to know and work with many men who exemplify to me positive masculinity. And it is one of the great blessings this congregation gives to the world that there are men here who exemplify positive masculinity. This congregation is a natural reserve, if you will, of men practicing positive masculinity. What a wonderful thing. And that is another reason why word needs to get out about how important this place is. I hope this congregation can be more proactive and thoughtful in getting the word out about itself. I hope this can be seen as something everyone has a responsibility to do and not just a specialized group of people who are supposed to do publicity. I have endeavored over a number of years to point out the various ways a UU community is an important place. This congregation has much to offer the community, including, but not limited to, being a reserve for tolerating and nurturing positive masculinity. Whether word gets out about this fellowship or not is all in your hands. It is something for you to do that is important. And now, special music.